Yesterday was the one year anniversary of the George Floyd death at the hands of Derek Chauvin. And a lot of people after that happened have been screaming about justice reform, yours truly included. I've been wanting to see some positive changes in our society. And so now that one year has elapsed, it's kind of time to take a look back and see what have we done? Where are we coming from? And where are we going so that we can see some real justice reform in America? Are we closer or not? We're going to turn our attention over to Chicago, Mayor Lori Lightfoot. So she unveiled a new plan for civilian police oversight. She's going to create a commission, but she's also going to keep the ultimate control of the Chicago police. So Mayor, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, do we have a picture of her? Ah, darn it, we don't. But she, uh, you'd recognize her. We've seen her before. We've talked about her on this channel. The very, I would say, eccentric mayor of the city of Chicago comes out and uh, gives a lot of very, you know, very aggressive speeches, doesn't like Donald Trump. And she has been promising for a long time justice reform, kind of the, one of the reasons she ran for mayor on the back of justice reform. And so people are scratching their heads saying, hey, you've been in office for some time now going to get to that justice reform issue that you campaigned on? Here she is. So now she's out. The mayor, according to uh, CBS2 Chicago staff, this was posted a couple days ago, Todd Fuhrer, uh, CBS Chicago web producer, writes, the mayor repeatedly has said, quote, because she wears the jacket for crime in Chicago, she's not willing to essentially hand over control of Chicago police to a civilian oversight board. So, you know, this is sort of the the rub right here in the beginning, right? A lot of people say we need civilian oversight. We don't need elected politicians to be beholden to the pol the police agencies. So essentially what they're, what they're trying to break when they talk about civilian oversight boards is sort of police control of the politics. What, what a lot of people think happens. And we see this a lot with people like Letitia James, the New York attorney general, she came out and said, that she was uh, all about justice reform when she was running for office. In particular, she wanted to, uh, well, one of her, her main campaign talking point was to go and investigate and prosecute Donald Trump and his family. But closely related to that, she talked about justice and justice reform. And lo and behold, we have a case that lands on her desk involving Daniel Prude, which is one of the most uh, insane killings by police that I've seen. They actually put a black man lying naked in the road in a hood, uh, uh, four or five white guys standing around him, put him in a hood and then do a full body plank on his neck until he dies, right? Uh, he died like three days later, basically collapsed his head and his skull and his windpipe in a way that he could not you know, regain breathing functions because an officer was, was like doing a full body plank on his head for a long period of time. So, right, a case like that, you would think, yep, absolutely, we're going to charge that person with a crime for that because it was as bad as Floyd easily. And this case lands on Letitia James's desk. She promised justice reform. What does she do with it? Nothing. She kicks it over to a grand jury. They choose not to indict those cops. Who knows what was presented at the grand jury, whether her office kind of threw that or not. Who knows? I would guess probably. We've seen a, this historically. We saw the same thing happen with Daniel Cameron in uh, the Breonna Taylor case. Clearly a case that, in my opinion, should have been prosecuted. It wasn't because the attorney general covers for the cops and people are sick of this crap. So what they want is a division there. They want some civilian oversight of the police department and the police uh, you know, agencies, and they want to create some division so that the police don't rain roughshod or run roughshod over the mayors and over these attorney generals because they've got huge unions, a ton of money, a lot of political power. And so we're sort of tired of their weight and their their uh, ability to create momentum in a political race, gone. We want to evaporate that. So how do we do that? We create a civilian oversight board to create some separation so that the, the civilian oversight board theoretically is not scared to death of the police and the police unions that are going to be you know, waging war against them in the court of public opinion. So the question for Mayor Lori Lightfoot was, are you going to create that division? Are you going to create a civilian oversight board and hand off power to them? rather than you, the mayor, retaining that power. But what do politicians do? They want power. She said, or let's see who says this. The mayor repeatedly said she wears the jacket. She reiterated that stance on Monday. She said, quote, public safety, I think, is one of the most critical responsibilities of any mayor. Me and anybody who will come from me. The relationship between the mayor and the police superintendent is critically important. Because the buck stops with me, I will ultimately, as mayor and any other subsequent mayor, be making that decision on hiring or firing the superintendent. However, the commission would have the power to assess performance of and set goals for 
those officials. When any of these positions becomes vacant, the commission would be empowered to conduct a search for new candidates, provide the mayor with a list virtually identical to the current process the police board already uses. The panel would have the authority to cast a vote of no confidence on the fitness of the superintendent. So while the commission would be able to weigh in on setting policy for Chicago, the police board, the seven member panel would not have the final say on policy. Oh, that's weird. Rather, if there were any policy disputes between the commission and the Chicago police, COPA or the police board, Lightfoot would review the party's positions and either direct the superintendent, chief admin or police policy to take appropriate action and explain in writing why no action is warranted. So she creates the board, but retains ultimate power. So it's sort of another death by commission, which is very, very common in this space. Politicians and criminal justice, as if you've been a part of the channel for a long period of time, you know this. They love to talk. Lots of talk. Oh, yeah, we're going to form a commission. We're going to investigate this. We're going to get to the bottom of this. We're going to mandate and make changes. Nothing ever happens. They create commissions. They move things around. They move a bunch of, shuffle a bunch of papers around on the desk. Nothing changes. Likewise, the new commission would also be given a chance to weigh in on the annual budgets. Oh, that's nice. They're going to be given a chance. Rather, before the annual city council votes on department budgets, the commission would prepare a budget submission, and then they're going to review it. The commission would also have the authority to direct COPA to investigate specific complaints of misconduct. The first members of the commission would be appointed by the mayor and the city council. Lightfoot would nominate five members. City council would nominate two, subject to confirmation by the full council. With a limit uh, four-year terms, the ordinance would establish a three-member district council once elected, one of the three council members of each district would be chosen to serve on a panel. We allow for this process to be really engaged. Lightfoot's proposal does not specifically say when the first district councils would be elected. Rather, the ordinance tasks the appointed seven-member commission with recommending a process as soon as practicable. Once the commission is in place in 2022. Oh, here she is. There's Lori Lightfoot. Recognize her, folks. We all know what she looks like. Faith added that. Thanks, Miss Faith. The mayor's announcement for her plan for a civilian police oversight commission comes just days after the safety committee told Talifero that he plans to hold a vote on the issue next month. A more sweeping proposal is being dubbed the Empowering Communities for Public Safety Act. The ECPS is a compromise that's going to push for competing plans of civilian oversight. Lightfoot pulled her previous support from the plan. We've got a civilian oversight committee. They're going to veto such policies by two thirds vote. All right. So here's, let's see here. We have with, with Lightfoot now finally unveiling her own plan. She now has a little more than three weeks to win over aldermen who might support this. The public safety is a vote is supposed to be held on January 18th. So, all right. So we got one, one attempt. We got Lori Lightfoot from Chicago trying to create this civilian board. Going to put seven people on there. Going to have a uh, you know, very, very, mm, I was going to use a word that I'm not going to use. We're going to call it uh, less than four to five results, let's say, right? N not a lot of, uh, lot of lot, not a lot of energy going on in this proposal, but we'll see if anything comes of it. Now, there is an alternative proposal. Okay, we talked about this yesterday. Somebody asked a question about civilian agencies, and one of my proposals was maybe we take, I don't know, three defense lawyers, three judges, and three prosecutors. We put them on sort of like the Supreme Court, you know, or, you know, get a panel of nine people, and you can rule on these issues. Sounds like they're trying to kind of go that route with a civilian oversight committee. We'll see what happens. Now, there's another way to do this. You could also just defund the police. Okay, we've talked about that on this channel. One of the dumbest ideas I've heard in recent, uh, maybe in my lifetime, it's that, that uh, asinine, but they're still running with it. And what happens when you defund the police, when you actually stop paying people to do things? What, want to take a stab at what happens? Guess what? People stop doing things. They just say, hey, oh, well, if you're not, I mean, if you're not going to fund me, I'm not going to do that. That doesn't make any sense. And we're actually seeing that happen now, unfortunately, in Seattle. So Seattle police are expected to lose 300 officers by the end of the month. And that's not a drop in the bucket, folks. That's a third of the agency. Okay, 300 officers from Seattle are bailing out. In a heartbreaking and revealing inter interview on the Ari Huffman Show, president of the Seattle Police Officers Guild, Mike Solan, said regarding police officers leaving, at the end of the month, we'll be close to 300 officers leaving. That's a third of the agency, he said. He told Hoffman that the loss of the officers was uh, from last year to date could range from 288 to 300. He described the departing officers as, quote, great human beings that do the job. They just want to serve. 
Some of the officers opted for early retirement. Others took law enforcement jobs in other cities or switched to alternate careers. This came over from the Post Millennial. They say that morale on the force is at an all-time low. Last month, Seattle police officer and trainee refused, was refused service at a local chocolate shop. The incident revealed a pattern of behavior by employees and at, at, at chains in other locations. Same day, a female officer was walking past her beat at a local public school when uh, approximately 10 third grade students raised their hands in the hands up, don't shoot. Reference to Michael Brown incident in Ferguson. Okay, 10 third grade students. BLM activists claim Brown was a victim of police brutality after he was shot, but investigators revealed that he had attacked police officers. Right, so there's a very, very curious narrative that's happening. You know, police are being dumped on all the time. And by the way, I do a lot of the dumping here. That's the part of that's the, that's the reason for this channel. I'm a criminal defense attorney. And even I can tell you that I have seen the pendulum swing way too far the other direction. And it really is a sad thing. I was very excited that we were going to talk about meaningful justice reform, talk about some common sense approaches like, I don't know, mandatory body cameras, maybe revisit uh, just more complete reporting requirements for police misconduct and keeping, you know, keeping more robust information about officers as they move around between different departments. I've talked about ending qualified immunity. I've talked about issues with police unions and all of that, but I've also tried my best to stay pretty close to reality on this topic that most cops, I think are good people. Many of them are just like you and you and I, we just want to live our lives, do some good in the world, have a nice family and be of service to our fellow man. And when we start to villainize them and we start to say that everything that they do is wrong and every single one of them is a racist maniac and every single one of them wants to murder black people, well, we start to communicate and create sort of a cultural environment that is problematic. And it really, if you're going to be scolding anybody or any industry, what can you expect to happen? Less of that. It doesn't matter if it's the police or anybody. If you scold lawyers or doctors or anybody, uh, eventually the entire industry is gonna get pretty sick and tired of it. And they're just gonna say, all right, it's fine. Look, you don't want us, we don't want you, no problem. We're gonna pick up and we're gonna move. We're gonna leave. We're gonna go to a place that does want us where we are appreciated. And there are a lot of places in this world that will appreciate good cops. I'd appreciate them right here in Arizona. So Seattle, come on down here. Let's see what we can work out if we have uh, openings, which I'm sure we do. But the point is good for them. Good for them for leaving. If they're going to be defunded and villainized, I would leave too. Crime has spiked exponentially across the city, as have the length of 911 response times. Last month, it took police almost an hour to respond to the reports of a gun on a public school campus. What, what do you expect? They're not funded. The Seattle homicide rate in 2020 doubled from 2019. It's continuing the same upward climb in 2021. Solon said one year ago, city officials were praising the department as a model of police reform for the country. Isn't that nice? That all changed following the death of Floyd and the riots. Riots ultimately led to the decision to abandon SPD's East Precinct, which resulted in the creation of the infamous Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. Right On Sunday, a podcast was released featuring... Seattle Police Chief Carmen Best, who said that the decision to abandon the precinct was not her own, was made collectively by her command staff. She said they did not even consult with her. So I said, we're not going to evacuate that precinct. We're not going to evacuate the precinct. I wasn't at the precinct at the time, so I didn't see what was happening. Boots on the ground. That was my last word. She hung up. I hung up. A couple hours later, it was like they evacuated the precinct. I'm like, what happened? When asked about the claim of command staff ignoring a direct order from the police chief, Solon said the ultimate authority in the city of Seattle is the executive, which is the mayor. And then those orders come down to the police, to the chief of police, and then subordinates under her. It'd be very difficult for someone underneath the chief to do something that is counter to what the chief of police has directed her subordinates to act on. So it's either the chief of police or it's the mayor who said abandon the precinct. Solon also discussed the decision by Capitol Hill Pride banning Seattle police officers from participating in this year's march but still wanting their protection for the event, right? So Capitol Hill Pride, they're, they're saying, police, you can't come. We don't want you here at our rally, but we want your protection, right? We don't, we don't respect you. We don't like you here, but we still need your protection. Seattle City Council unanimous vote on Monday to move 911 dispatching operations out of the control of Seattle police into the hands of a yet to be established civilian-led community safety and communication center. So it's, the police don't get to do that anymore. Now it's community safety. So what does that mean? Who knows? It's up to our community to recover this city and take it away from the activist crowd. Solon said it's up to the community to get Seattle back to a moderate community. Yeah, right. So here is a quick clip of this. Listen, Seattle PD to lose 300 officers by the end of May. 
this is now, you know, kind of a want to just make a quick pause on this issue. So Seattle police officer Guild Mike Solon right now, you know, these are these are very, very common sort of prolific very pro police organizations. So take that with a grain of salt. You know, I'm not saying what the, what this guy is saying is dishonest, but if he is, he's trying to make a political statement here, right? He's trying to say, hey, your policies are going to cause a lot of problems. So he has a he has a, a motivation here. Just want to point that out. Here is the clip. Are I mean, at this point, if you guys said, oh, we're not going to protect the parade because they're boycotting us, they'd call you a bunch of bigots and racists. You guys are in a no win situation. Well, we know based upon the fact that we're human beings that want to do the job of policing to serve others. We have to serve others that hate us, that loathe us, and those obviously that support us. We swear to that oath of service, and that oath of service doesn't discriminate against anybody. And, and I, I think that's the amazing thing about ironic. the police department. Uh, that's, Exa- th- well, yeah. It's exactly what it is. It's about the amazing people as human beings that do the job of policing. And that's just it. We're humans. Right. And, and I think that's what gets lost here is that people equate us as just being these robots that people can discriminate against. Well, no, you can't. We're human just like you. And we do a difficult job and we serve you. We're willing to give our lives to you but don't for a second we're going to allow you to dis- dis- discriminate against us because we're police officers police officers should be adhered to as heroes people willing to live lay down their lives in the service of others and anybody else that shouts otherwise guess what the seattle police department is currently hiring why don't you come join our community-based agency and take part. And if you want change, come be a part of the change process and see how policing is really conducted. And this is the most progressive agency in the United States of America. And our elected officials recently said such said such <clears throat> just Doesn't a matter. year ago that we are the modeled reformed agency doesn't matter they don't care it's never going to be good enough never uh so you can just keep playing the game this is this is the thing you know you you hear people all the time say never apologize donald trump did this if you start apologizing and playing this game it's never good enough right they uh, apparently the most progressive police department in the country now they want to defund it no you don't get to do 911 calls you don't get to show up at our pride parade we got eighth we got third graders now freaked out of you because of what we're teaching them in schools and He's frustrated as hell. I don't blame him. Now, you know, a couple points on this. Now, he says, you know, we're not all, all all robots. Well, a lot of a lot of you are actually, which is part of the problem. We're saying we want to see more humanity out of you. We don't want to see robotic police officers that show up, grab a 73 year old Karen Garner, and just throw her down like like it's just business as usual. And it wasn't just one guy. He goes back. His partner was doing the same thing. He went back. His supervisor did the same thing. There's a cultural problem with police departments that I've got an issue with. That being said. I totally agree with this guy. Right? Not every one of them is a, is a rotten maniac that deserves to be discriminated against. If you don't like discrimination against any demographic in this country, but you're suddenly okay with it when it comes to police officers, maybe maybe you should be asking yourself about that. Maybe you're you are a discriminatory person then at that point, right? You're you're prejudging people based on their profession or their skin color or their badge in, in this case it's not appropriate and so you know we're we're trying to come to the center here. We're trying to to to, to rectify the issue, but how can you do so when you're dealing with an unreasonable opposite side? I talked about this yesterday. If BLM wants, according to their own demands on their own website, I'm not making this up, to literally defund the police, how do you start a conversation with that? I understand negotiating. I understand starting with a big ask and sort of the, the concept of persuasion. You know, go in, I want a million dollars. Well, you're not going to get a million dollars. All right, well, I'll take 500. Well, that's perfect because that's what I was thinking too. And you sort of start big and ask small. That's not what they're doing here. They want the police defunded and they are moving aggressively in that manner. And they're proving that they're going to be successful. Police are leaving, 300 officers leaving. Now he says that, uh, you know, well, we're, we're not leaving. We're going to protect everybody. You know, all this rah, rah stuff. We're the police. We were, we protect people, whether they like us or not. I can appreciate that a lot. I'm a defense attorney. Most people don't like me, right? A lot of people look at me and go, you human debris. How could you even possibly, 
what a monster you are. So I get that. I understand what that feels like. Uh, and I understand uh, working and being of service in the face of that. It's sort of a kind of a badge of honor to some degree. But at the same time, if if I was working for the government and the government said, we're not going to pay you for this work anymore, I'd be like, all right, well, so long. There are other governments that will. And there are other people that will appreciate my work. I don't have to, to you know, succumb to the doctrine of self-sacrifice and just, you know, uh, prostrate myself over the entire Seattle city because I'm a Seattle resident and I'm a police officer who's just going to give it all up in the name of honor and duty. No, man, to pick it. They don't want you there. Take your family, come down to Arizona, go over to Texas, go to Tennessee. There are different cities that will happily have good officers. We'd love to welcome you. So pick up and get the hell out of there. And if they want to continue down this road, let them keep defunding the police. See what happens, folks. It's going to be so bad. You're going to see. You're going to see. Uh, what I'm what I'm envisioning is sort of a repeat of what happened in 19 in the 1990s. We had this really bad crime wave, allegedly, that all the politicians went haywire over. Joe Biden, in particular, and many would argue that Kamala Harris got her her start in politics by being this very aggressive prosecutor and prosecuting crime. And so we have this crime wave. We have this cycle of crime wave. We're going to defund a bunch of police. 10 years. We're going to see the consequences from that. We're going to see a lot of crime. We're going to see a bunch of, you know, elected politicians get out there bloviating 10 years after that saying, well, we got to crack down on all this crime. We got drugs in the streets and blah, blah, blah. Then they're going to, you know, Joe Biden Jr. Hunter Biden's going to be running for president and he's going to come out here and say, well, we got to crack down on these criminals. You know, I'm a former drug addict and we're going to do all this crap and we're going to fix the system. And then they're going to pass all the same laws that Joe Biden passed when he was doing the same thing back in the 80s and 90s. 84 crime bill, 88 crime bill, 86 crime bill, 1994 crime bill, mandatory sentencing, crack cocaine, five years automatic first defense. Those are Joe Biden's rules. More black people are in custody because of him and Kamala than Trump or any other Republican living or dead. So, we'll, look, we're, we're, the, the people who are going to be hurt as a result of this defunding the police are the same people who are upset now. When we have another really aggressive crime wave and an aggressive response from our useless politicians, who's going to be hurt? It's the same communities that are trying to solve the problem right now. They just don't see it yet. Right now, it feels really good. They're very angry and they want to defund the police and they think that that's going to be something meaningful, but it's not. And there's going to be a backlash and it's going to hurt the justice reform movement. And it's going to hurt people who are going to be going to prison because we can't get our crap together in our justice system. All right. So uh, let's take a quick look at some questions. We've got, uh, oh, no, before we get there. Here is uh, Andy. Andy, no. So, so this is what's going on in Portland. Uh, Portland Antifa tried to burn down the Justice Center tonight to commemorate their burning of the same occupied facility a year ago. So we got we got a lot of places we're checking in at. Chicago, they got a civilian oversight committee that sounds like it does nothing. Then we go over to Seattle. 300 cops there are leaving, and they can't go to the Pride Parade, and they can't walk by a third grade class without getting uh, sort of. Um, let's say interesting reactions from the kids. Then we go over to Portland and they're burning down the same building that they are, uh, that they burnt down a year ago. So good progress there. It looks like they tried to burn it down. So I'm not sure if that actually was accomplished or not, uh, but here it is. So this is a video that Andy posted. <laughs> One year. It's been one year. St still the same thing. Nothing's changed. They tried to burn that down in May of last year. They're burning it down again. So really good progress that out there in Portland. That mayor should be really proud of himself. Jack Elias says, how could I feel uh, comfortable with a civilian oversight board that is utterly ignorant of being on the front line of having to decide in a split second whether to fire a weapon or not of someone that has never put their body uh, between a victim and their abuser to get hit so that they can make an arrest because the abused will not testify. It's a good, it's a great point, Jack Elia. It's a great point. Very well written. I appreciate that. And I think you're expressing a lot of the frustrations that a lot of people have with this, you know, and a lot of cops too. And I've been, I've been somebody who, who watches a scene, watches police. And I say that was a bad shoot, but I wasn't there. Right. I don't know. It, I'm, I'm, I'm armchair quarterbacking this like the rest of everybody. And so you know, we're always trying to do that. We're always trying to ask people to put themselves in other people's shoes 
and pass judgment. We do it every day in court. We ask judges who were not there to make rulings. We ask jurors who were not there to make rulings. And so we're always trying to decide how to do this. The opposite, right? So if, if, I, if I take your perspective on this, which I think is extremely valid, by the way, and if I, if I reverse that and I said, okay, well, what if we just put a bunch of cops on there? What if we just filled up this, this, this oversight board with a bunch of cops like it kind of currently is? Well, the downside to that is that they review it and they go, yeah, I mean, sh shoot, man, I would have shot him too because it was a very, you know, they're sort of primed the other direction. I'm primed more towards, you know, I, I believe the police are, are experts and should be considered you know, heroic when they wait. Not necessarily that they're all by default heroes. They're just regular people doing a job like all of us are. But when they do heroic things, we should reward them for that. And one of the heroic things is waiting. It's that split second wait. It's that gray area. Okay, I'm not a trained police officer. So if somebody feels like a threat to me, first thing I'm doing, shooting, right? Asking questions later. But the police, we say, we, we need you to wait a split second because of you have this training, you have this power, you have this ultimate responsibility. We need you to wait a split second. So that's part of the job. It's part of the training. They agree to that. They accept that. They recognize that they're going to be put in these situations and that they got to wait a little bit. That's why they're police. We expect them to wait. That's where the power is. So you know, we're trying to find a balance. Do we put some civilians on there? Do we put former police on there? Do we split it? Do we put half former police, half civilians? How do we balance this out? But a lot of people are not happy with the current system. We got High Desert is in the house. Says Phoenix City Council voted to create the Office of Accountability and Transparency for civilian investigations of alleged police misconduct. AG, AZ ledge. Oh my gosh, you've got numbers here. Uh, a, a house bill that requires all boards to have two-thirds sworn officers. HB, another one, requires 80 hours of post. What happens when the city council thumbs its nose at, states, at state legislators? All right, two-thirds sworn, 80 hours. What happens when the city council thumbs its nose at state legislatures? Um, I don't know. I, I actually don't. I, I apologize. I'm not understanding this question for some reason. Civilian investigations... So I think, I think you're asking what happens when the city council says that we're, okay, I think, I, I think I see what you're saying. I think the question is why, what happens when the city council says we're not going to comply for our local police departments with, with Arizona law that says that you have to comply by these rules, 80 hours of post training, two thirds of sworn officers. I'm not familiar with these bills, to be honest. So I'm not, I'm not really sure how these all interface with each other. But if you're saying that this was passed, Arizona is telling the cities that they have to comply with certain things and the state, uh, I'm sorry, the city does not do that. Uh, ultimately, what I think you'll see are lawsuits. You'll see um, uh, injunctions. You'll see orders from the judges. Uh, or you'll, see, you'll see the state government saying that we have passed a law. Your city governments are under jurisdiction of this law. If you're not complying with the law, we're going to file a lawsuit. We're going to basically be demanding that the court order you, you know, grant an injunction demanding that you do these things. And if not, that there are repercussions that the city has to pay. So it's going to be, you know, a state versus city and the state will win on that. But I'm not familiar with those bills, so I'll have to take a look at that. Those are uh, those those are interesting bills that are coming down the pike. Thank you for that comment, High Desert. High Desert must be an Arizona fella. Good to see you, my fellow Phoenician or Arizonan. We have Leafy Bug is in the house as we already have civilian oversight of the police. It's elected officials. The civilian oversight board is not a solution. It'll end up stuffed with activists who will make things worse. We already have the structures in place that could deal with the problem. We don't need more. Civilians need to engage more with these structures to drive the change they seek. You know, I'm actually, I'm actually uh, sort of in alignment with that. You know, I, 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 I don't want to create a bunch of solutions that make people feel good, but don't actually solve anything. You know, we could create these civilian oversight boards, but if it's a bunch of people out up, up on those boards who are just screaming about, you know, whatever, and it's not a real, it's not connected to reality. Well, then that's just as useless as what we already have. So I, I agree that we don't need to start taking a bunch of action just to solve things, you know, but there are already a lot of issues that we can, you know, there, there are existing institutions and procedures and ways of doing things that are okay. We can improve them. We don't need to necessarily just throw them out. We're going to defund the whole thing. Just get rid of the entire police department. We're going to start from scratch. That doesn't make any sense at all. We've invested a lot of time in trying to figure a lot of this out. Not every aspect of policing is bad. There's a lot of very good stuff there that we've figured out over the years. Keep some of that. Take the stuff we're unhappy with. Raise it up a little bit. And we can all 
we can all you know compromise somewhere in the middle we have liberty or death says i understand the police bailing why should they stay if this is a if this is how good they're treated a Marine Corps JAG recruiter asked me if I wanted to sign. I told him a JAG recruiter is a, a, a judge's advocate general. So it's sort of a, a lawyer in the armed services. I told him I was retired from the army and that I joined the army because even Marines need heroes. When we were done laughing, I told him that there was no way I could serve this president after he's initiated this woke surge in the military. He says he was retiring for that reason. It's going to happen in the military too, folks. Yeah, I mean, look, people don't want to go people, uh, police officers and soldiers to go, you know, ride on unicorns and build rainbows around the world. We have Jeremy Matrita says, doesn't the Constitution mention the government will provide for the common defense? I would guess it is not constitutional for a city to not provide enough protection from harm for its citizens. Just a thought. Yeah, so you're sort of seeing, well, uh, common defense, I think, of the nation, but the uh, the federal government doesn't have any real jurisdiction over local law enforcement. So which is why it sort of trickles down to state and then city uh, and even county levels. So they don't have an affirmative duty to go provide police services to you. There's actually a Supreme Court case that is directly on point on this. I think we've talked about it before uh, on this sh on this show. I can't recall the name, but there was a case where the police uh, showed up, let's say 10 minutes late. I, I, I read this back in law school, not since then. So it's been quite some time. But let me uh, let me f try this one. There was a case where somebody called the police. Police got there late, right? Maybe they should have been there in five. They got there in uh, 30 minutes or maybe they didn't come at all. I don't remember. Whatever. Police didn't get there in time. The person who called the police sued the government, said the police should have come. So and so wouldn't have been killed. They would have lived. They uh, you know, whatever major damages. The government has an affirmative duty to come and help. I pay my taxes. I'm a good citizen. I called 911. They didn't get there. They owe me an affirmative duty to, to respond and provide help. Guess what the court said? No, they don't. They don't owe you anything. Okay. You can call them if they show up. Good. Good for you. Glad they came. If they didn't come, nothing you can do about it. You don't have a claim. You can't sue them for that. There are no repercussions. So people think that the police are sort of, you know, they have to come and help and do something. They, they don't unless something's changed recently. But that case law says that the government doesn't have an affirmative duty to come and help you if they do that's great but they don't have an obligation to and you can understand why right you can understand why that is it's actually a good rule okay i don't i don't want that rule i don't want people to say that every time they call the government that they got to show up and come fix their brakes and change their tire and mow their lawn i don't want that at all government says no we're not coming it's your problem fix it i think there should be more more of that not less all right we got tree mendes is in the house says Here's what makes me sad. The narrative encourages black people to be scared to walk to the store. I admit there have been arrests gone bad. There have been situations where they are trying to arrest the wrong person that have gone bad. And when was the last time you heard of a person of any race walking to the store being shot by the police? It bothers me that black people have been living in fear due to the false narrative. Both parties use fear as a tool and it disgusts me. Yeah, you know, I, I, I hear a lot about that. You know, I hear people say things like, I was reading something and I heard somebody say that they're teaching their son. That's an African-American, you know, author. And they, they were writing that they were teaching their son that walking down the street is dangerous as a black man in 2021. Right. And now, obviously, uh, and I've never walked down the street as a black man. I don't know. But based on my experience, I have seen a lot of black people walking down the streets. And in my opinion, I've not seen a, a, never, not one time danger for for a black person walking down the streets walking down scottsdale road going to a park going to a football game walking down you know between bars when i was drinking and a, a, a lot of it i've never seen that not once i've never seen a black person be in a situation where there's a bunch of white guys you know running them down and and lynching them up is doing i've never i've never seen it now i'm not saying that 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 that's not something that never happens okay obviously that stuff happens but when I was reading somebody teaching their son that this is the default in life, that this is just how it is as a black person in America, I have a hard time buying that narrative. Okay, now, I, now, now, now I, in general, and I'm saying that there are different pockets around the country where certainly this is happening, right? And it's happening for all sorts of people, black people, white people, right? There are, there are dangerous pockets of the world. There, life is not 
sunshine and rainbows for everybody. There are situations where that is the reality. And I get that. And I, I didn't have that great of an upbringing either as a young boy. So I understand, you know, some of these environments, but the default being for somebody who's a middle-class person to say that, you know, my son is now walking around on a daily basis, walking, watching out whether the police are going to just show up and kill him. And I'm thinking that is just such a sad way to live. You know, oh my gosh. I mean, even if that were true, why would you want to teach your son that from three years old and have them living in this world where that's what they think? Now, you might be sitting there listening and saying, well, I think that's actually accurate. I think that is the perspective. Okay, George Floyd, for example, police just showed up and he's dead. So how about that, Rob? How about that example? Well, you're right. There are examples of this. And there are many, many thousands and millions of examples of that not ever happening. So if we're going to be, you know, I, don't, I don't have kids, but if we're going to be teaching our children and, you know, and, and conducting ourselves in a way that encourages one of those two lenses on the world, one of those two paradigms, which one is more productive and which one is more connected to reality? Is it that every time that you're a black person and you step out of your building that a cop might kill you? Or is it that, you know, mostly life is pretty good. And if you do a couple things, it's really good. And as long as you sort of, you know, live on the straight and narrow, the, the possibility of you ever dealing with the police is virtually zero, right? It just, it, 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 honestly, it breaks my heart. It makes me so sad for these kids. Thinking about these kids just being taught like white people are going to kill you, right? White people are racist. Every single white person in America is a, you know, a, a descendant of slavery or you know, some sort of, you know, plantation owner or something like that. It's just really sad. It breaks my heart because it's not true. All right. Liberty or death says scary, right? We all know creepy Joe isn't going to serve his full term. What if they force Kamala I say Kamala on that word to retire. And he appointed Hunter for VP then resigns. <laughs> oh, why not? Yeah. Put Hunter Biden up there. Hey, I mean, at least he knows where he is. So that would be fun. We have Chris. I want to thank all the questions from locals and I want to welcome Christiana into the house. Welcome to the community, Christiana. I appreciate you being here. And if you want to sign up and ask questions like we have seen today, and you want to just get a lot of other great things, you can go to watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We have a lot of great questions today. Longer show. I appreciate all the great questions. We also have some things you can download if you go over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Things like my PowerPoint slides that we just went through today that Miss Faith helped to craft up. You can download a copy of my book here. It's called Beginning to Winning. It's free over on Locals. You can download the PDF. You can download the impeachment party documents. You can download the existence systems personal productivity template for free right on over there at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. You can share links throughout the day and meet with some great people. We also have an event coming up on Saturday, June 26th. Mark that down. It is going to be our second monthly locals meetup. Oh, it's going to be fun. The first one was really good. We had that last weekend on May 22nd. And so we're going to, you know, we're going to do it again because it was so much fun. But before we do, we're going to meet on June 12th for our law enforcement interaction training, which again, excuse me, is available and free if you are a supporter at locals.com. So you can learn how to deal with law enforcement respectfully and in a way that's going to diffuse the situation, not turn into something worse. And most importantly, protect your rights, which is what we really care about. So the, the, the uh, available June 12th, and that is it for me, my friends, before we sign off and get out of here for the day, quick reminder that I am a criminal defense lawyer here at the r, &R Law Group, and we love to help good people facing criminal charges find safety, clarity, and hope in their cases and their lives. So if you happen to know anybody in the state of Arizona, or if they live outside of the state of Arizona, but they have a case in Arizona, we can help. We can help them clear up old records. We can quash warrants. We can restore the right to vote. We can help them re restore their right to possess a firearm again and apply for other federal benefits. And the list goes on and on. There's a lot that we can do to help. So if you happen to know anybody in the state of Arizona who does need that help, we would be honored and humbled if you sent them our direction so that we can provide an opportunity to help. We'll make sure that they leave our office better than they found us. Before we head on out of here, quick reminder that the contact information for our firm is down below, along with some other links to some other channels that I have started. So I am uh, now, now discussing cryptocurrencies, which I'm very fascinated about, uh, you know, got into that a little bit today. But there was a new video that I posted on that channel uh, that came out today that involves the IRS. The IRS is now, they posted what's called an RFI. It's called a request for information on their website 
on the government's website where different contractors will go. And they're looking for security experts who can hack your crypto wallet. So the IRS is now trying to build their own sort of data center where they can crack into your wallets when they seize your, your cryptocurrency. So very interesting stuff going on in this space. If you're interested in the cryptos, please check out my channel below, uh, Robert Gruller Crypto. And then there's some other channels as well that I'd encourage you to go plug into. We're going to be diversifying some of the content a little bit and uh, experimenting with that to see how YouTube uh, responds. So check some of that out. I know it's, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of different channels and I spend a lot of time plugging stuff, but I appreciate the support. We're trying to experiment and play around a little bit. So I, 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 uh, Thank you for your help in that. So that is it from me, everybody. We are done for the day. We're going to be back here same time, same place tomorrow, 4 p.m. Arizona time, 5 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. on that East Coast for that one Florida man out there. Good luck to him. Everybody else, have a tremendous evening. Sleep very well. Have a nice hearty dinner. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.